Hello and welcome to United Church Online. We're so glad that you decided to join us today. If you are new to United Church, why don't you fill in the Connect card in the description or visit our website for more information. So let's ready our Bibles, notebooks and pens as we get ready to receive the Word together. We are in week two of our Follow Me series. Have you guys been finding it helpful so far? Pastor Randy did a phenomenal job of unpacking what follow me um, basically looks. And it's, it's, it's a series that is aimed at teaching us to look at the life and the teachings of Jesus so that we can be followers of Christ. It's to look at his teachings so that we can understand how to be a Christ follower and in turn invite others to walk along this journey with us. However, how many of us know this morning that we can't lead people to a place where we have never been? And so the heart of this series is that we would learn to be a people who follow Jesus effectively so that we can lead others to follow Jesus effectively as well. Being a follower of Christ is a lifelong commitment. It's not like the gym membership that we signed to where we're only committed for three months. No, this is a lifelong commitment. Amen, church? It's like a marriage. We enter into a covenant. We're in this for the long game, you know? Following Jesus is a journey that requires us to be steadfast in our faith. The definition of steadfast is to be firmly fixed and not subject to change, to be firm in belief and determination, and to be loyal and faithful. Following Jesus requires us to be firm in our belief of him, not being swayed to the left or to the right by any of the other teachings that come but to be loyal and to be faithful to the journey, to stay true to the way, to stay true to him. It requires us to be completely sold out for Jesus. There is no plan B at all. And if we're ever to make it to the finish line, then we need to be steadfast in our faith in Christ. Psalm 84 verse 5 puts it this way. It says that blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage, As followers of Jesus, we are on a journey. We are pilgrims on a journey to a place where God's dwelling is now among his people. And the only way that you and I get there is if we follow Christ. Christ is the one who will get us there. But we need to follow him. We need to be faithful to the way. Amen? Amen. He is our guide and our shepherd who leads us there. In order for us to effectively get to where we are getting, to where we are going. There are things that you and I need to safeguard ourselves from, things that we need to watch out for, things that can easily derail us from the path in which we're walking. And and we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 11, from verses 2 to 6. And this is the account where John the Baptist finds himself stuck between a rock and a hard place. He is questioning the identity of Christ. And I believe that there are three things that you and I can learn to guard against from this passage of Scripture. But before we get into the scripture, just for a bit of context, who is John the Baptist? So John the Baptist was a prophet from God who was sent to uh, what you call it, declare the coming of the Messiah. John the Baptist was actually a gift from God to his parents. Elizabeth, who was his mother, was actually unable to um, conceive children. And so one day an angel of the Lord appeared to um, Zechariah, John's, John's father, and said to him, your wife Elizabeth is going to uh, uh, give birth to a son. And he is going to have the Holy Spirit upon him even before birth. Think about that. Just imagine that. You know, he is, his, his role is to, to declare who, who Jesus is. His role is to prepare the people, the, 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 the Israelite people, to lead them back to God by declaring uh, repentance, by speaking repentance, leading them back to God and declaring and preparing the people for the coming of the Messiah. That was his job. That was his purpose. That was his call, which is a very big um, call, by the way. So John the Baptist went forth and he led the people towards repentance and declared the coming of the Messiah. John the Baptist is also the man who, 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 who physically baptized Jesus and witnessed how God affirmed Jesus as his beloved son. He was there. He saw the heavens open up. He saw the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus like a dove. And he heard with his own two ears the Father say, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. He got to see that firsthand. He didn't hear it from somebody else. He experienced it from himself, for himself. And in John chapter 1, John is also the very same person 
who when he sees Jesus walking along the road, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the world's sins. He was extremely uh, certain about who Jesus was. I need you guys to understand this. He knew who Jesus was. I understand that he, it was his cousin, but he knew that there was something different about um, Jesus. We, you may be my blood, but there's something different about you. There is an anointing upon you. You are a holy man. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah and he was certain of it. And yet, John finds himself in Matthew chapter 11, caught between a rock and a hard place where he's doubting the very thing that he believed. And we pick it up from verses 2 and it reads as follows. It says, John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we keep looking for someone else? Jesus told them, go back to John and tell him what you have heard and see. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life and the good news is preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. After this, John's disciples then leave and then uh, Jesus then begins to tell um, the people about, about John. Let me tell you about John. And he begins to tell him how, how John is, 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 is one of a kind. And I believe from this passage of scripture, there are three things that you and I can learn to guard against as followers of Christ. Are you guys ready? The first thing to guard against is misaligned expectations. Misaligned expectations are the expectations that we have of God that are not aligned to his character or his truth. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you had an unmet expectation? Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you thought the situation would end in a particular way, but it didn't? <laughs> it, was, it was Valentine's Day on, wait, on Wednesday, ladies. <laughs> Have you ever found yourself <laughs> expecting something and getting something completely different? Perhaps it was a gift and you, and, you, and, you, and you were leaving hints for your partner saying, I want this one. And it goes one ear and it comes out the other and they get the other thing. How did that leave you feeling? <laughs> the truth is that when what you desire does not match what was delivered, then there is always frustration. Yeah. I remember my mom uh, telling my cousin and I, my mom is very smart. I remember my mom telling my cousin and I that she was going to take us to Sun City. So I was ecstatic because I've never been to Sun City. I mean, this is going to be the first time um, I'm going to be there. It's, it's going to be fun, right? And so we pack our bags, um, we get prepared and we go to the bus and we, we, we were on our way. And as we're busy driving, um, we get to this point where now I'm, 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 like I'm, I'm waiting with expectation because I'm like, we're going to Sun City, right? And then it gets to this point where I'm starting to see houses, né? but houses in a rural area with like, uh, what you call it, gravel road. And I'm like, no, man, I'm sure Sun City has like tarred roads, you know? The path to Sun City will look completely different. Lo and behold, we did not reach Sun City. We were in a rural area in, in the Northwest. I think it was about five to 10 minutes away from Sun City. But we were at this big house, uh, parked at this big house, the bus stop. And in that moment, I looked at my mom. And I was like, mom, this isn't Sun City. I was so frustrated. <laughs> it turns out she, um, so, so what happens is that every year, well, like once a year, the Mtumkulu family, that's my mom's uh, maiden name. Um, they come together um, all across um, South Africa, if affiliated with them. So they, they, they put money together, they get together um, at this house, and they basically discuss the history of the Ngunis and um, what you call it, the Mtumkulu family. So it was a nice experience, don't get me wrong, but it still wasn't Sun City. <laughs> I wanted Sun City, <laughs> you know, and I found myself frustrated because I didn't get what I had expected. And truth be told, it is one thing to experience a frustration of an unmet expectation that you had from a friend, a family member, or a job. But what do you do when you were frustrated by an unmet expectation that you had of God? What do you do when God doesn't do what you think he should have done? 
And this is where John finds himself. In Matthew chapter 11, John finds himself in a particular place where, where, where he expected something different from Jesus. And his expectation is unmet. Think about it. Jesus, uh, John the Baptist was sitting in prison. So he had all the time in the world to think, to really think about what was happening. Verse 2 tells us that he heard about all that Jesus was doing. I can imagine him sitting and thinking, Jesus, you're doing all these miracles for everybody else. But what about me? What about me? I am still in prison. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where, where you saw other people receiving breakthrough while you're still praying for yours? How difficult is that? I can, I can imagine him thinking to himself, is this it for me, Lord? I've done nothing wrong. The fact that he was in prison wasn't because of something he did wrong. He, he got in prison for doing what was right, for standing up for the truth. And yet he finds himself in prison. Why are you leaving me here? Why am I in this place? See, misaligned expectations will always lead to frustration and disappointment. Why? Because they're not aligned to God's character and his truth. And as a result, they'll never be met. What are some of the examples that you and I can have of misaligned expectations? They could include, perhaps you thought that the Christian journey would be all about being saved and nothing more. No work. We're just going to be saved. We're going to sing Kumbaya for the rest of our days and we're going to be with the Lord. And, and, and I have slightly bad news for you. It's not, it's not, it's not it. Yes, we, we we're called to be with Jesus. Don't get me wrong. We're called to learn how to grow more intimately with God and to be with him every uh, a step of the way, every, every, like 24-7 to be with him. But there's, but there's the other hand where we've been given a mission and a mandate to make disciples, to invite other people into the very being with Jesus so that they can experience it for themselves too. So there's a duality. It's two hands in this. Perhaps you thought that the Christian life was without trouble or suffering, that the Christian life will go smoothly and that you'll always have wealth and wealth. Well, Jesus tells us in John chapter 16, verse 33, that here on earth, we will have many trials and sorrows. We'll have many trials and sorrows. And who was he saying this to? It wasn't just the general public. He was speaking to his followers, people who had devoted their lives to him. He's saying to them, understand in this life, on this earth, you will experience hardship. But take heart because I have overcome the world. Take heart, I've overcome the world. All we need to do is to ensure that we faithfully follow him. If we faithfully follow him, he will lead us through the trials and the tribulations. Perhaps you thought that God would answer all your prayers with a yes. Well, if God did do that, then he wouldn't be God. But rather, uh, the appropriate term would be a genie. And that's not who God is. God is Lord. He determines what's good for us. He dictates our lives, not the other way around. The problem with misaligned expectations is they, they can cause a rift between you and God. They lead to disappointment and even offense. And because our expectations aren't met, we end up walking away from God. We need to realize that it all starts with a misaligned expectation. Perhaps you're here and you thought, God, why won't you make them love me? Why won't you make them change? Why didn't you make them stay? Why did they leave me? God, I pray to you that you would change their hearts and yet they still left. You know, although God is a changer of hearts, as Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 26 tells us, I wish I'd actually placed this on the screen. He says that I will take out your stony and stubborn heart and give you a tender and a responsive heart. Although he is a changer of hearts, he still gives us choice. I love Ezekiel 36, 26. He says that I will give you a tender and a responsive heart. I will give them the ability to respond. But the responsibility to choose is still on them. I want to release somebody from the idea that God was never for your relationship or your marriage. God is more, uh, he's more committed to the union between you and your wife than you will ever be. He is committed. 
And the unfortunate part is that we live in a fallen world. And we've got choice. And so even though God gives us everything that we need to make the right choice, we can still choose to go the other way. And so we find ourselves frustrated because of the misaligned expectation. So how do we guard ourselves against um, expectations that are misaligned? Number one, we ask two questions. The first question that we ask, is it aligned? Is my expectation aligned with God's character? Because God will never go against who he is. He'll never go against his character. And the second question to ask, is it aligned with God's truth? Is it based off of a biblical principle? Is it based off of promises that God has given us that we can hold on to? If not, then we, then we need to check our expectations. If our expectations don't pass the test, then we need to adjust our expectations till they align with his character and his truth. We need to guard ourselves against misaligned expectations. Church, they are the root of, of, of causing a rift between you and God. And the second thing that we need to guard ourselves against is disappointment. How many of us know this morning that unmet expectations can lead to disappointment? Disappointment in God. Disappointments can leave us feeling discouraged where we are disheartened and we lose confidence in God. John the Baptist was discouraged in this passage of scripture. He had lost his confidence in God. The very same man who was so bold to stand up and say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world is now finding himself in a, in, in, in a situation where he's questioning Jesus, are you the one we were expecting or shall we wait for another? See, disappointment will, 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 will cause us to question the things that we know. Doubt will creep in. We'll begin to question the very things that we were firmly grounded in. However, what I love about John's response is that he didn't let his disappointments lead him away from God. Instead, he ran to God with his questions. And I wonder how many of us this morning think that we will offend God with our, uh, our honesty. I wonder how many of us, when we have questions, we choose to run away instead of running towards our God and actually confronting him with our feelings. Can I suggest this morning that God welcomes our questions and our honesty? Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 puts it this way. It says, come, let us reason together. Talk to him. Reason it out. Let's talk about it. Tell me how you feel. And allow me to give you perspective. Allow me to change your way of thinking. Don't run away with your frustrations. Talk to me. I welcome them. Jesus took the time to answer John's question. I'm going to park there for a little moment. He took the time to answer John's question. Don't ever think that your emotions or your feelings don't matter to God. They do. He will take the time to answer you and to meet you exactly where you are hurt. And he answered in a way that he knew that John would understand. Verse 4 to 5 says, Jesus told them, go back and tell him what you have heard and what you have seen. He said, the blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised to life and the good news is being preached to the poor. Notice how Jesus doesn't defend himself. He doesn't say, I am the Messiah. But what he does is that he, he takes John's attention and he, and, and, and he shifts it. He shifts his focus to what really matters. And he knew that John would, would, would get to the conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah. See, disappointment will cause us to focus on all the things that God isn't doing. And we will completely miss all the things that God is doing. And this will lead to further frustration and disappointment. It will cause us to dwell. There's nothing worse like dwelling in your frustration and in your disappointment. And the disappointment will begin to take root in our hearts. And so how do we deal with disappointment today? Number one, we do what John did. We run towards God with our disappointments. Run towards God with your disappointment. Don't don't hide it away. Don't hide your feelings away. Go to him. If you're frustrated, tell him how you truly feel. 
And number two, the second thing that we do, we focus on what God is doing rather than focusing on what he is not doing. God is working whether we see it or not. And it's up to us whether or not we're going to develop the eyes to see where God is working. If we don't do this, church, and our disappointments are left unchecked, the sad thing is that a disappointed heart can turn to an offended heart, which leads me to my third and last point. We need to guard against offense. When disappointment takes root in our hearts, it turns into offense. An offense is a snare that the enemy uses to trap you and to derail you from God's best in your life. Ask yourself this question. How do you truly follow somebody that you're offended with? How are we ever going to effectively follow Christ if we've allowed offense in him to to, to prevail? If we're ever going to be true followers of Christ, then we need to guard against offense in our hearts. Otherwise, when we let let our hearts get offended, we begin to backslide. We go back on our convictions. We go back on the things that we firmly held on to. Um, uh, uh, once, one, the things that we believed in, we go back on that. We may be present here physically, but our hearts are long gone. There's nothing worse like that. There's nothing worse than, 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 than being in a place just because for the sake of being in a place, but your heart is not there. We backslide into living a double life where we eventually walk away from the faith completely. Why? Because we've allowed offense to creep in. Pastor John Bevere authored a great book. I highly recommend it. It's called The Bait of Satan. And it basically deals um, with offense and how we can guard against it and how we can combat offense in our hearts. I highly recommend this book. And he says in his book that an offended heart is the breeding ground for deception. I'm going to say that again. An offended heart is the breeding ground for deception. The enemy will use your offended heart against you. His aim is to get you away from following Christ. And if he can keep you in offense, guess what? You will automatically walk away from God. You won't need somebody behind you busy encouraging you to walk away from God. You will take the decision to be like, you know what, God, I'm done with you. And you'll walk away. When we're offended in God, we start to believe the lies. That I'm better off doing my own thing. God is not a good God. Does God even exist? Is he real? Why would a good God do these particular things? The universe helps those who help themselves. God is not for me. And we walk away from the very source of life and cling to counterfeit things that only bring about death and destruction. The enemy will use offense against you to trap you. And then one day you'll find yourself trapped in your unforgiveness. You'll find yourself trapped in your bitterness and in your rage. You'll find yourself trapped in, in, in your victim mentality. And then you wonder why you always feel like things are always happening to me. You wonder why I'm always angry. You know, I remember in 2014. 2014 was a very difficult year for me. Um, I met a girl and I, and I fell in love. Um, <laughs> there's, always, there's always a girl <laughs> in the story. <laughs> And, and things began to, to plummet from there out. I soon found out that her parents um, disapproved of me because of where I was born, where I was from. And that, and that, that, like that, that, that broke my heart. It was my worst fear at the time. Like The worst thing that could ever happen was being denied by my person's parents back then. And I remember praying earnestly, praying that God would change their hearts. I prayed day and night for God to change their hearts. I remember even getting to the point where I said to God, God, I need you to move now because you are losing me. <laughs> Imagine that. We laugh, but I was, I was holding on to the tips. Like, I was about to let go. I was like, God, you are losing me. <laughs> You see, I had a misaligned expectation of God that led to disappointment. The truth is that the relationship wasn't good for either one of us. And God will never lead us to something that will bring destruction into your life. And so long story short, 
My disappointment in God turned into an offense. And I got to a place in, in my life where I said, you know what, God, I'm done with you. I'm done. You call yourself a good God. I'm done with you. You don't hear my prayers. You don't see the sacrifices that I've done. I'm done with you, God. And I still came to church. And I still served on team. Showed up every day. Smiled. Too blessed to be stressed. But during the week, I was living my own life. Why? Because my heart was offended. Because my heart had turned away from God. All because I allowed a misaligned expectation of God to turn into an offense. But I thank God for his loving mercy. I thank God for how his love led me back to him. He sent people around me, followers of Christ, who loved me just because they could. People who didn't come with an agenda. People who didn't say, we're going to go through this book of 10 steps on how to be an effective Christian. No, they just loved me for who I was. They just wanted to be my friend. And I started to see how God used community to heal my offended heart. I started to see how God started to lead me back to soften up my heart so that I could choose him again. And so practically speaking, how do you and I guard against and combat offense? Well, we combat it with community. Godly community who will help you see things differently. Godly community who will pray for you and with you. Godly community who will call you out when you have lost the way. Godly community who will love you towards wholeness and towards peace. We were never made to do this thing called life alone, church. We are genuinely better together. We need people on this journey who will encourage us, who will spur us on. And in the moments where we lose the, we lose the way, they can lead us back onto the way and encourage us to keep on going. There's a famous African proverb that says that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. The aim, church, is for us to get there. For nobody to fall away along the way. And we do that when we're together. And so to conclude, it is very difficult to follow somebody that you're offended with. It's very difficult to follow somebody that you're disappointed in and frustrated at. And I pray this morning that we would align our expectations to God and his character, to his truth. I pray that we would run to God with our disappointments, that our disappointments wouldn't cause us to, to run away from him, but we would run towards him. I pray that we wouldn't focus on all the things that God isn't doing in our lives and that we would focus on all the things that he is doing. I pray this morning that we would plant ourselves in godly community. People who will love us and keep us accountable. And ultimately, I pray that we would all get to where we're going. That we would all reach the destination for nobody to get left behind. Matthew chapter 11 verse 6. And this was Jesus speaking to John's disciples. And he added, it says, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. The amplified version says, God blesses those who are not offended by me. Don't fall away because of an offense at God. Commit to the journey. Be steadfast in your faith. Remain loyal to Jesus. Be firm in your belief of him. Be faithful to your commitment that you made to him. And God will surely bless you. Amen. We trust this message was helpful to you. We'd love for you to stay in touch. So follow us on Instagram at United Church SA or contact us on our WhatsApp number. Be blessed.